So, this is the latest Rebel Wisdom podcast, uh, an exciting one, because this morning I did an interview with Jordan Peterson, which is the second interview that I've done and the first time I've seen him since uh, I saw him last October, which we then turned into the documentary Truth in the Time of Chaos and then Glitch in the Matrix. Um, so yeah, it's really exciting to yeah to sort of see where he's at and obviously the kind of trajectory that he's been on since then has just been so exponential. Um, and yeah, I was really pleased with like we talked about sort of being a bit concerned that he was getting burnt out and um, didn't get a sense of that at all from from meeting him. Um, it was really yeah he was on good form. Um, and I think we've got some really, really interesting stuff and we're going to play some of it in this podcast, referring specifically to the Sam Harris debates because that's just happened. And yeah, so he's done four, four debates with Sam Harris now, two in Vancouver, one in Dublin, one in London, uh, on the subject of religion versus atheism. And the other thing is to kind of look forward to what else is coming up. We've just come back from the US, we've got a huge amount of content, some really exciting stuff. Um, we just put out an interview with Paul Vanderclay, the um, kind of pastor from Sacramento who's becoming kind of a little mini online celebrity because of his commentaries on, on Jordan Peterson. And, and one person commented, the pastor of the IDW. Paul Vanderclay, officially the pastor of the IDW. Congratulations, Paul. It's now official. Three YouTube comments making the same one makes it actually official. So. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, um, Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. So, I haven't been to any of these debates, um, and, but we've listened, someone's very sneakily put some of the audio online, so I've listened to some of the stuff from Vancouver and some of the stuff from, from London a couple of nights ago. And we've also commented quite, like we've been interested ourselves in kind of this interplay between um, like we've said quite a few times, for, for me, for you I think as well, Jordan Peterson represents a kind of potential reintegration of the sacred, grounding it in neuroscience, grounding it in mythology, and it's clear that Sam Harris is very sort of... The irony is they're both within this kind of loose collective called the IDW, but they've clearly got very different perspectives, which I guess is why so many people have gone to see them talk over the last kind of four dates. For me, you know, equally listening to the kind of the bootlegged stuff and kind of engaging with the debates, there is a sense of something new happening in the sense that the traditional kind of new atheist argument has this um, real focus on religion almost as a political force and the kind of irrationality of it and all of that, but some of which I can engage with and some of which I, I would even, you know, agree with. Um, but what Peterson seems to be bringing and what these debates are kind of exploring is a, is a different kind of um, exploration of maybe what we call the religious impulse rather than looking specifically at religion but taking that deeper level and looking at um, the impulse within us as you know the biological, historical, cultural impulse in us which is so deep to be religious creatures. Um, and I, you know, I feel like Jordan Peterson is coming or, or reintroducing that into the culture um, and Sam is, is holding a, a different piece, which is a kind of warning against the fundamentalism that can come about with religion, which is a fair warning, definitely. But the paradox that we're going to explore is that that kind of viewpoint in itself, what you could call scientism, is in danger of becoming a fundamental, fundamentalism itself. If not already. So. If not already. Um, and this is something we're going to explore. So we're going to uh, play a clip now. Um, the first, one of the first questions I asked Peter, uh, Peterson about this, which was, um, started by talking about the IDW, which we'll put out at some future time. But the, what a lot of people are sensing from the IDW, why it's sort of quite common, uh, intellectual dark web for any of our people who haven't been watching our other stuff, um, is there's a sense of they're asking really big questions and there's some really big ideas and great thinkers in it, but ultimately what I think people are tuning into is a sense of people thinking in public and a sense of this is what it looks like for two people to engage in a generative dialogue around different ideas and one that sort of builds. So, so yeah, that's, that was the starting point of this question that we're going to roll now. There's a kind of intellectual curiosity 
and a sense of people thinking in public. Mm. And, and there's also a sense of maybe the potential for people to change their minds or to, to, to discover things during the conversation. Yeah, well, that's partly the appreciation of the intelligence of the audience. It's like, and I would say it is actually the manifestation of the process of thinking that's more important than the conclusions that are generated. Even in these discussions that I've been having with Harris, like we are trying to, to argue out two different viewpoints because Harris believes that values can be derived with, with, with unerring precision in some sense, using the proper methodology from facts. And I, I believe that it's more complicated than that, that there has to be intermediating structures and that those are really narrative in, in their nature. So there's a technical argument, um, as well as a variety of sub-arguments about the relative role of traditional religion and so forth. But the outcome of the debate about those issues is partly what people are coming to the talks to see, to, to, to determine what should the conclusions be. But a much larger part, perhaps, is to, in, to observe and engage, at least by proxy, in the process of dialogue. And that's more important, because dialogue is the process by which complex problems are solved, which is what makes me a free speech advocate, fundamentally. Well, it's not an advocate, it's like I realize that, that the protection for free speech is protection of the mechanism whereby complex social problems are solved. And we're, we're the people in this group, and many other people as well, are acting out that dialogical process. And, and, and people are happy about that, as they should be. Based on what Jordan Peterson was just saying, and then also listening to the, pod, sorry, to the debate, um, what really struck me was, was one particular moment when Sam Harris um, mentions, uh, you know, talks about the mystical, or I don't think he would refer to the mystical experiences, but the deep, experiences he's had through Buddhism and, and I believe psychedelics as well and then he kind of makes a comment around yeah but I, I, I wasn't sort of um, I'm not sure if gullible was the word but something around that I wasn't kind of gullible enough to kind of attribute that to something other than the workings of my own mind and then Peter Sisson says you need to take a bigger dose um, it's a it's a great moment in the debate as well and it really you know even though it's kind of a fun moment it also points to, to maybe for me one of the, the deepest aspects of this because in the debate, I get a sense that Harris, his, his understanding or his model of religion that he's putting out is one uh, which is very much the structured religions. And Andrew Sweeney, in, in a recent piece on Rebel Wisdom, he mentioned that this model of a god with like a bearded man in the sky that uh, the kind of atheists tend to use is not really the religious understanding or the model of God that people who, for whom religion is an important part of their lives use. No one who's serious about religion believes that type of model at all. Um, and that's, that's an interesting thing for me because it gets back to that point of there's a difference between the internal experience we have, the internal religious experience, which is about experiencing the transcendent. It's not believing in anything. There's no belief. There's no space for belief. It's you have an internal experience. That is, that is the religious drive and that is the religious experience. I think Harris is absolutely right in the sense that you cannot take that experience. I can't have some deep psychedelic experience and be like, David, I've just figured out that uh, everyone's, we're actually, Earth isn't Earth, we're actually all sitting on a massive green elephant and I really need everyone to know this, so we, I'm really, really going to put this out there. You can't do that because science is the language we use for you and me to agree on what we can both agree on. Like, look through this telescope, what do you see? Okay, well, I have a hypothesis about it. Well, you're going to try and disprove my hypothesis until we reach a synthesis where we can be reasonably, like, really, really sure about what's in that telescope. So those two things, they can't cross over. And, and integral studies is big on this. They can't cross over, but they can coexist. So finally, to Peterson's point around it's the discourse that's, in a sense, more important that really connected with me when he, when he says that because they could do a thousand debates and they are never, ever going to solve this, the science versus spirituality thing. Yeah, I mean, listening to the recent one at the O2, you get the sense of, and I guess you've got the sense since Peterson and Harris started talking that they're talking past each other. Yeah. And you frequently hear Sam accusing 
Jordan of not answering the question. And it's interesting listening to that because I didn't get that sense that Jordan was, was avoiding the question. Like, it's interesting. I mean, I obviously listened to a lot of Jordan Peterson stuff and uh, listened to quite a lot of Sam Harris's stuff as well. Like, I've got a lot of respect for the, the Waking Up podcast. There was a Spectator article this morning, really good Spectator article, maybe we'll link to it under this, where the writer was saying he, he thinks Jordan Peterson has a bigger view than Sam Harris, mm -hmm. that he understands Sam Harris's perspective better than Sam Harris understands Jordan Peterson's perspective. Now, I think that's true. Obviously, we've, we've done a lot of stuff about Jordan Peterson. Um, and just for a, a point, we did actually ask if Sam Harris would be available for an interview while he was here in, in London, but he wasn't because um, I'd love to put some of this stuff to him. So Sam, if you're watching, we'd love to interview you, I'll give you a chance to respond. Um, but, I, but I did get the sense that there was a frequent kind of reducing to caricature by Sam Harris that I didn't think, I didn't get that feeling from Peterson. Peterson started a huge amount of his, his comments with, yes, yes, but, like including, like he includes a lot of what Sam says. Sam kind of seems to continually reduce it down to the material or to the human, and Peterson says, yes, and, which, which is really interesting because we talk about integral theory quite a lot, and the whole idea is yes, and. and Peterson seems to be yes, anding Sam Harris an awful lot. He's saying, so Sam Harris is saying, well, hang on, are you saying that this was divinely inspired? How can you tell you that this book was divinely inspired? And Peterson is saying, well, we don't know where creativity comes from, that in some sense, creativity comes from somewhere we don't understand. And if you take creativity over millennia, where things are refined and refined and refined, what is kept of that particular story has to reflect something, has to reflect some kind of divine reality. Mm. Or, well, it has to reflect some kind of reality which you can choose to call divine or not. And Sam continued to kind of just brings it back to, no, this is just people's imagination, or just this, this is just. So I do feel, yeah, very frequently that Peterson takes does understand that incorporates Sam Harris's reductive worldview, but frames it within something more. And yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, another thing that struck me, um, Sam Harris actually makes a really good point towards the end of the last debate, where he says, look, he starts talking about consciousness and our understanding of what consciousness is. And he said, you know, that could have been a place we started this particular debate. Uh, and they may well have covered that in the, in the first two. I'm not sure if I've ever seen them. But that is, I think, a really key question because there's, you know, we talk about the soft problem of consciousness and the hard problem. And the soft problem is effectively how is our neurobiology um, involved in how we perceive the world. And that's soft because we can do brain scans and we can look at it and we can, you know, we can experiment that, we can figure that out pretty much. The hard problem is what is consciousness? And, you know, is it local or non-local? As in, is consciousness a, uh, an, uh, quality of the universe which is everywhere and we happen to be recipients of that with pantheism. a yeah pantheism effectively or is it specifically just in the human mind you know all of that question that has not been answered yet and it also there is a sense that it can't be answered yeah so and this is this is where i keep coming back to the the sort of my real um, frustration with the more strict strict materialist types because you can't have a worldview that says well, we understand pretty much everything apart from consciousness. It's like, okay, so you can understand absolutely everything apart from the thing that's experiencing absolutely everything. Mm. That's a pretty big hole in your theory. Mm. And f to, to maintain this kind of very dogmatic materialism without accepting that mm. this is, you, you're like, okay, just give me that one miracle of the fact that we can experience anything and then I'll explain everything. It's like, no, mm. sorry. You're, you're asking for a, it's a different kind of, because they argue that religion is sort of miraculous or magical thinking. It's like, no, actually, you've got a magical thinking going on as well, just the same as believers. Mm. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point as well. And, and not just the magical thinking, but also the, the dangers of dogmatism that can come about. I'm not talking about Sam Harris here necessarily, just what my experience of very extreme materialists, because I'm one of the organizers of, of Breaking Convention, of Psychedelics Conference, and that is possibly the main tension at that conference is we have neuroscientists and we have, I guess, psychonauts and explorers and artists and poets and all sorts. And the tension is between the materialist worldview and one which is more centered on the phenomenology of the experience and mystery and, and faith. Not Faith isn't quite the right word, but the religious experience, let's call it. And I notice 
um, what I pick up from the extreme materialists is a value system in which internal experience and the claims or the, the value of internal experience is lower than the value of uh, scientific reason, always. That those two things there. Now, I think they should be on equal footing but in different domains and serve different roles. But the smugness and the snideness um, comes, I think, from partly from that value structure. Yeah, I think this is a good place to start the, the second Jordan Peterson clip. Um, because, yeah, I think it talks to this sort of potential dogmatism on the materialist side as well. So, role number two. I read a spectator review of your um, recent conversation. I think you've now come to the end of your debates with Sam Harris. And they said that you expressed a little bit of irritation at some of the, some, when Sam didn't grasp some of the points that you were making or that you didn't fully appreciate that he'd un understood them. I also think that Sam Harris in particular, like he's built a whole kind of personality, career, several books on this atheism position. Do you think that he can argue in good faith from that perspective? Could he turn around and say, well, actually, no, you're right, Jordan, this atheism thing is a bit oh, no, I think he was. I think he was. I think he was conducting the discussion in good faith. I actually think that what Sam is doing is a good faith project. You know, he, I think there's conceptual muddiness about it. Um, but, you know, he, his basic premise is that we could come to an agreement that working to reduce unnecessary misery and suffering is a universal good. It's like, okay, fair enough, that seems like a reasonable proposition. I don't think it's a proposition of fact, and he claims that it is, but that doesn't matter. Still, it's fair enough, man. And then, you know, so that's one proposition. Another proposition is, it would be really good if our systems of value weren't founded on air. And what do we have that's not air? Well, we have facts, we have objective facts. I mean, look at the technology, look at what we've done with our science. It's like, you don't want to underestimate the utility of objective facts, so maybe we can ground the value structure in the facts. It's like, well, that would be good if we could do it. So, and, and, so, and then his, his ethic, let's say, is an amalgam of those two propositions, and I think that his project is honorable, and, and, and I think he's committed to it. He also, rightly, is concerned with the dangers of the fundamentalist dangers of revealed truth um, and so is very skeptical about about the axiomatic claims of of dogmatic religion it's like yeah fair enough but his the mechanisms that he outlines to derive values from facts are insufficient in my estimation. I don't think that his argument is sufficiently sophisticated, even though I don't doubt it's... I don't think that Sam is any less committed to an ethical good. It's not obvious to me that he is than I am, you know, and he's argued and discussed fully in good faith as far as I'm concerned, you know, with the, with the odd error, because no one is negotiating 100% all the time in good faith. I mean, that's a standard that no one can, can, can achieve. But I think the discussions have been unbelievably productive. And, and we'll see that certainly the crowds are respond. I don't think the crowds would have been engaged if Sam wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been discussing in good faith. You know, because the en engagement is actually an indication that a good faith discussion is, is occurring. Otherwise, it gets dull very, very rapidly. We'll see what happens when the videos are released, and that'll be in August, uh, once they're, the sound is edited and all of that. And, and then people will have a public debate about how, it, how the discussion proceeded. I also think that each discussion built on the previous one, and that we both ended up, I think we both ended up more informed and more articulate than we started out. So that's a, good, that's a really good thing. I certainly understand his arguments much better than I did well, a year ago, let's say. So I think that exchange kind of illustrates the point that I made. I mean, I asked him whether Sam Harris was arguing in good faith, because, I mean, if you look at it from this perspective, look, Sam Harris has written like two or three books on atheism. He is one of the most kind of noted celebra celebrity atheists, with possible exception of Richard Dawkins. So he has a huge amount professionally at stake. So I guess my question about good faith was, 
is it possible for him to change his mind? And I was kind of looking, yeah, I really didn't know what, what Jordan would say about that. I, I had a sense that, um, yeah, that there was some irritation sometimes in the way Sam was kind of caricaturing or, or minimizing some of the things that he was saying. So I, I was genuinely interested in whether he thought that and genuinely kind of, um, yeah, really interested in his response. Um, which I kind of found to be like, there's a, there's a, it seemed to me to be a lot of generosity in there. It's like, yeah, I really value Sam's project. I think it's really good. And a, and a lot of honesty about where he sees the conceptual moddiness and, and all the rest of it. But the interesting thing for me is reading below the comments on the leaked, the recently leaked talk from London. And I've seen this a, a few times, like the Matt Dillahunty talk with Peterson as well. I find the, the material, the sort of atheist types to be far more dismissive of Peterson. Oh, Sam destroyed Peterson. Peterson's avoiding ans answering the question. All of this, I find them far more dismissive of Peterson than I hear Peterson being of Harris or generally Peterson's fans being of Harris, which is interesting. It kind of speaks to what we said before, the danger of a dogmatism in the atheist camp that can become a kind of new religion. Yeah, and as, as you're saying that, um, something kind of came up for me, which I, I've thought in the past, which is um, when atheism does go that far, um, and it won't be all of his supporters, but it'll be, you know, some, there is that strand in the world. When it does, it becomes a religion in a sense based on um, being able to control everything. There's, there's a real sense of that for me because, you know, Peterson in that clip talked about it would be good if our values weren't based on air. And that really stuck with me because I was like, hmm. But going back to that sense of we don't know where creativity comes from. We don't, we don't know. Just that sort way. of respect for the mystery. Respect for the mystery. And the ego really doesn't like letting go into a mystery. You know, that's, that's part of the inside of a lot of the Eastern traditions as well. Um, so that kind of strikes me as... as as an interesting point because, I mean, to be honest, the irony is the, the, the pre-Socratic philosophers, they were getting their information, Parmenides and Pedicles, they were receiving their wisdom, which became logic, uh, from mysterious kind of transcendent experiences. So we have based our values to a degree on what they might call air, but th that that's concept that they might see as air is actually something potentially very different. I would see it as something potentially very different, that it has substance in it, that there is some substance that arises up that might be the root of creativity or you know, whatever else. We don't know. But that sense of we don't know, there's a humility in that. And there's not very much humility in we do know, and it's just a matter, of, and anything we don't know, it's just a matter of time till we figure it out with science. Yeah, because that's something that, that I've thought as well. It's like, at some point, your axioms have to be, or not have to be, they, your axioms are based on something irrational. Mm -hmm. You cannot rationally derive axioms. So the idea that we can be purely rational, at some point you are making a leap of faith. Yeah. You cannot avoid making a leap of faith. It's like, what is your, what is your leap of faith going to be? What are your original axioms going to be? Mm -hmm. You have to kind of, at some point, assume some things. And so what are those things? And what was really interesting as well in the, in the O2 debate, one of the things Douglas Murray said, which was what we're seeing in the world seems to be that when you remove religion, people will make new religions out of anything. And I think we're seeing this particularly on the left at the moment, sort of like the whole equality, diversity, what you might call, like, call SJW thinking or um, has become a new religion. I think we're all kind of aware that this is, that there's, there's a really a real dogmatism that seems to have arisen um, that, that is replacing the, the old religious stories and obviously also kind of returning us to group identity and the danger of that in terms of the sovereignty of the individual and all of that, which, which I talk about with, with Jordan Peterson quite a bit and we'll, we'll have coming up uh, in one of our future, future um, videos. Um, what I was also reminded of, there's a great line, one of the guys that we interviewed in America talked about so scientism is this kind of worldview that sort of sees science as, as the guys in their white coats. It's the new religion, the guys in their white coats. And it happens at a very subconscious level. It's like you use scientific validation to, to support something. Like, oh, the benefits of meditation. 
oh, it's this airy-fairy thing. No, now there's mindfulness and we have these studies and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Suddenly it's, it's, yeah, it's the new priesthood uh, in many, many ways. But he, he had this great line which was, scientism is more dangerous than jihadism because at least jihadism has, doesn't create nuclear bombs. Science, scientism has all of the technologies or AI or any of these things if you divorce science from any kind of ethical and moral responsibility, and it's clearly not obvious, as Peterson says, how you reintroduce it once you've, once you've got rid of it. Mm. Harris seems to think that you can. So this is a crucial, crucial question. Once you've removed kind of the ethical grounds, which we could argue, um, Rupert Sheldrake in one of our videos argued, mm. they're ultimately Christian in origin. Like the, this ethical basis that you take as self-evident, Sam Harris, mm is actually based in a whole, whole Christian story that's acted out through our actions and through our assumptions and it's, it's a Judeo-Christian worldview. You get rid of that and you don't get an emergent morality. You get science torn free of emergent morality and that, as, yeah, that is a terrifying prospect. Yeah, definitely. And I, Murray makes a really good, I thought that was a really good um, point by Murray, it was around the, those new religions that we're seeing effectively, which are kind of ideological, kind of semi-strange political SJW style religions and, and on both sides, in fact, it's like they're not based on what's come before. They, those, the, he says the people who are doing that, they don't know what their ancestors created before. They're just trying to create this split and build something on foundations that don't really exist. Uh, and that's, that's quite a strong argument for really engaging in religion and seeing how these systems have survived for so long and what tenets they hold, um, which is another subtlety which was in the debate around religion as a political institution, organized religion, which I would be with Sam Harris on around the massive problems with that, and religion as Jordan Peterson talks about it, which is like looking at the deep archetypal truth that exists within it, which, which doesn't really cross over necessarily with um, you know, the Spanish Inquisition or um, what the Catholic Church is up to in a certain country. Yeah, yeah. and as Peterson says, Sam Harris in, in his books and his lectures doesn't grapple with Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. doesn't grapple with Nietzsche, doesn't grapple with these thinkers who've wrestled with the human condition mm -hmm. and often resorts to a ca caricature of religion that most religious people don't believe. Um, yeah, so Sam, if you're watching and you want to respond to any of this, you're more than welcome. Um, your publicist has my details. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's look forward to what we've got coming up yeah. and really exciting, like I was, I was very taken with some of um, Peterson's answers today, particularly about the relationship between the individual and collective identity and the left, which I'd never heard him make before. And this, I think, will be the centrepiece of what we're, we're looking to do next week because there's a, I've seen a few people on the left now really grappling with Jordan Peterson in a kind of sense of what does the left have to learn from Jordan Peterson. And that seems new to me. For a while it felt like most of, like there's obviously the radical left which hates him and then there's the kind of, in, there's the sort of the soft left which is really unsure about him. And I had a sense for a while that they were just wanting him to go away. And he hasn't gone away. <laughs> So now the sense is, okay, and, and it's quite a brave thing for people on the left to be doing that because there's, he's obviously quite a, quite a kind of um, polarizing figure and, and hated figure by some areas of the left. So I want to kind of acknowledge the bravery of the people on the left who are engaging with his thought. Um, and what we want to do next week is a whole series of programs looking at what can the left learn from Jordan Peterson? Yeah, and I think it's a really good timing. I've noticed that sense of something shifting on the left around identity politics in particular, and the left kind of sorting its house out. And then last night, uh, there's a now, now quite viral tweet of Barack Obama talking about effectively the dangers of identity politics. Um, and specifically using Mandela as an example of someone who was able to transcend that, learned Afrikaans in prison, really, you know, challenging and just disputing this idea of like, oh, if someone's, you know, for example, white and male, they can't possibly uh, understand you or, you know, just bringing back empathy. So Barack Obama bringing that into the, 
into the conversation, I think that's quite a big moment. So I think there is a kind of shift happening and it's a good time. Great. And any housekeeping? We've got a, we've, we've now launched our podcast channel. Yes. So our podcast is also now available on Spotify. So type in Rebel Wisdom. It's the one with our logo, not the one with one podcast in February with a completely different logo. You can listen to that, but um, I haven't heard it yet. So yeah, Rebel Wisdom is on Spotify. It's on Podbean. We'll put all the information down in the, the show notes as well. And subscribe to the channel so that you can be kept in the loop of the other Jordan Peterson clips, which will be probably coming up next week, um, and the whole series about Jordan Peterson on the left and this kind of interesting crux point that we seem to be at in the conversation around identity politics. If you've enjoyed this and want to help us make more films, please consider sponsoring us on Patreon. Again, the details will be down there in the show notes. See you next week.